we're going to have uh, Jason Rohr now. Most of you probably know Jason from his games Passage, Gravitation, uh, Between, maybe Primrose. Jason's one of the main members of the art games community and going to be talking to us today about interactive storytelling. Come on up, Jason. Brief introductions. Olivier, Olivier just won't stop bugging me here. <laughs> All right. Um, so for the starting point of, of this talk is a, a starting point, sort of a, a launching off point, foundational point that I use for a lot of my talks. It's sort of this, this quandary that we have. And it's, it's sort of a premise of this conference in a way. Um, and, and the premise of this conference is, is, is sort of really to, to question this premise that's so commonly discussed in the game industry, right? And that's the idea that games have this, um, this major legitimacy problem in our culture. The game, some people say games exist in kind of a cultural ghetto. And if you've seen some of my talks in the past, which a number of you have, you've seen this slide before. And this is the way that I, I show, I sort of depict as a diagram this kind of, this, this, this thing that's talked about so much, right? Where you have this cultural line in the sand, if you think about it that way. And above the lines, you have these mediums that have sort of established themselves capable of creating, you know, tidy messiahs, right? <laughs> Masterpiece level great works of art or whatever they are. And uh, then down below the line in this ghetto area, you have video games and maybe, maybe comic books were there once and maybe they've risen out, I don't know. Um, but some other, some other kinds of forms are down here. Um, but above the line, you have mediums like, um, you know, like theater and novels and photography and films and paintings and sculpture and, and even rock and roll, you know, like uh, uh, Ionesco's Play La Lesson and uh, uh, Nabokov's Lolita and Taos, New Mexico by Cartier-Bresson and David Lynch's film uh, Blue Velvet and Picasso's Guernica and uh, Monument to the Third International by Tatlin, the sculpture, and, and you know, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and then you know, in the game industry, we're often talking about, you know, sort of the pinnacles of artistic achievement in our medium and what are the things that are so great. And we're always, you know, we're always talking about Shadow of the Colossus, right? We really put that kind of thing up on a, on a, on a pedestal and admire it and say, wow, it's getting there. It's, it's, it's so, you know, emotionally charged and evocative. And, and you know, even if going back in time, we, we look back fondly on something like the original Legend of Zelda for, you know, what was Miyamoto start trying to say about his childhood and, and this kind of mood of, uh, of enchantment and alienation that's kind of spooky and scary and lonely at the same time and so so palpable and Metal Gear Solid 2 wow it had this really uh, real strong postmodern tendencies it's very self-referential but take any of these things that we put up on a pedestal and say those are sort of like we're talking about games maybe being art that those are some of the things that we really really value and we really cherish it's really hard to put any of these kinds of things toe-to-toe -to -toe with something like Lolita um, and uh, just I guess just in terms of basic artistic merit, in terms of complexity, in terms of depth, and those types of things. And you might say, well, but Lolita's a novel, and these are games, and games are different, and, and that's why. But all these things above the line, they're all different, right? I mean, you can't really compare Lolita to this sculpture, um, you know, in terms of its formal properties. So it's not really the form of any of these things, because these things all have different forms. Um, you know, it's something about the achievement, and the complexity, and the meaning of the work, and so on, that really, where really these things can't go toe to toe. And there's something about, video games that makes us think about them differently than we think about board games. And that's sort of a premise of this conference too, that something changed 30 to 50 years ago when we started making games on computers, and we started thinking about them differently. That's what made us start asking this question and putting them on, you know, putting them on a diagram like this makes sense. We, you know, uh, we weren't really putting board games on those diagrams. And why? I don't know why that is. You know, maybe it's because video games are on screens, and then we sort of think about them as media because they look like media sort of on screens, and then we sort of look up here above the line and we say, what are video games going to kind of be like, what's the model? And we model them after movies a lot of the time. We try to make them more cinematic to make them more artistic. Um, and then, you know, as game designers, we really ad admit and we often demand, um, some of us, that the games, they are different from movies and they must be different from movies, you know, s sort of somehow. And then the question is, but how? Um, and it's also really interesting to note that, you know, board games and film coexisted as mediums for about like 90 years, right? And no one ever really pointed them out as being similar, right? And even today, we don't make this board game movie connection. We don't think about board games being cinematic or them being sort of like movies or any sort of manifest destiny of board games towards movies or them taking over movies and being the movies of the 21st century, right? Um, but like I said, we think about video games differently and, and we don't really think about them in terms of rules and systems. I mean, yeah, like if I get together with designers, we sort of talk about them that way and we like to play a lot of board games and think about our, ga our, our video games in terms of rules and systems. But in terms of big picture terms, um, 
you know, as far as the medium is concerned as a whole and the direction of the medium, it's really about something else. It's something that's sort of like this, the big I word, right? Interactivity, right? So then we sort of stumble into this kind of default mode of thinking about video games where they're very similar to movies, right? If you kind of squint and look at a movie and a video game side by side, they kind of look kind of similar, but they're like movies but interactive, right? Um, you know, you can imagine something like this, right, in the future. Um, <laughs> and, and how do movies, you know, then we say, well, they're very similar to movies, but they're interactive. And how do movies explore the human condition and, and, and deal with complex issues and, and transform the audience and do other sort of art type stuff? Um, they do it by telling stories, right? Um, that's movies primarily. That's, you go to a movie and you see, that even in Blue Velvet, it's, it's kind of about the story and these characters. Um, I mean, yeah, of course, of course, there's cinematic aspects to it, and David Lynch is communicating through the coloring and the choice of lighting and the camera angles and the set design and all these other things, too. But, you know, we really think about these moments in the movie, right? With Dennis Hopper doing this crazy thing and, and the other characters' reaction to it. Um, so then we, when we think about video games kind of becoming art-like and we start thinking about them in those terms, then um, we really start thinking about them as a storytelling medium, right? And I think it's because we're using movies as this model. Um, but... Um, but as designers, we really, we really hate the games are sort of moving this direction a lot of the time, right? We hate cut scenes and other cinematic kind of stuff. And we, we hate cop being copycats of movies. But we're really not complaining about the end goal. It's more like we're thinking, wait, 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 you're doing it wrong, right? Because you see, like, in the backs of our minds, there's many of us, I would say maybe even almost all of us, sort of secretly have some sort of pipe dream, some sort of back burner project, some sort of way we think about doing this, about cracking the real problem, right? And the real problem is how to make interactive movies without borrowing any of the non-interactive baggage from movies, right? Um, you know, how you might make uh, what you might call like a, a totally interactive movie, right? Not just like mostly a movie with a little bit of interaction, but the whole thing's interactive, right? And, and these ideas, these sort of back, you know, you talk to a lot of game designers, and they all have this sort of pet project in the back of their minds. Like, if I had the funding, I would, you know, even Frank Lance is guilty of this. He was talking about this thing that's basically an interactive movie to me. I, I swear it. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so we all have these pet projects at the backs of our minds, and we're all dreaming, like, if I had the funding, it's just that the funding isn't there or something. Um, but these, these ideas usually have a ton of hand-waving involved. Uh, Frank's admittedly did. His was, his was you know, uh, unsinkable. But, um, but uh, you know, the idea that you're going to set up these systems of emotion and these mechanics and these relationship mechanics and, like, uh, parameters for personality values for all these different characters, and you're going to stick them together in the sort of story world and let them kind of churn against each other, and through this really intricate mechanical web work, you know, some kind of interesting story and dramatic situation is, is going to emerge from that. And, you know, you might kind of call this the clockwork approach, right? And on the other hand, there's this other approach that's, that's been talked about for a long time, too. Um, and that's the idea, that involves a lot of hand waving, too. It's the idea that you're going to set up an AI, an artificial intelligence for each character in the, in the story world. And then you're going to set up this other AI over top of the whole thing, which is called the drama manager most of the time. And that AI is going to direct the whole thing and maintain an interesting story arc. So yeah, these characters are acting as autonomous agents, but then there's this, this AI kind of whispering in their ears saying, go do this, it'll make the story interesting. And, um, and let these, these AI systems churn against each other. And somehow, through all this very complicated AI system, some kind of interesting story will emerge. And you can kind of think of this as like the HAL approach, right? In both cases, we're really banking on emergence, right? We're sort of like letting emergence, hopefully, in these hypothetical systems, solve the hard problems for us, right? Like, it's real complicated, and there's all these different things, and put it all together, yeah, yeah, of course something interesting is going to emerge. How could it not? It's so complicated. You know, we love emergence as game designers. It's, it's sort of like game designer religion, right? Or, or game designer catnip or something like that. Um, but when the rubber hits the road, and you actually sit someone down in a pitch meeting in the industry who has one of these ideas, and people have pitched these ideas in the industry, and say, well, how is that actually going to work? How would you actually implement it? And where's the technology existing today that would actually help you do that? And how are you going to tell me for sure that something interesting is going to emerge out of all this complexity? It's really hard to envision how either approach would end up producing interesting stories. Um, and for whatever reason, this has mostly been like a lot of vacuous hand waving, and no one's really sunk a lot of time or money into it. Uh, over the past 30 years, people have just talked about it a lot. No one's really worked on it too much, except for this guy named Chris Crawford, <laughs> who sunk 17 years into his version of the clockwork approach with what I think even he would admit, if you talk to him, I've talked to him about it, at this point he's given up um, pretty much and gone off to look for other work, but his results were not as impressive as he wanted them to be, even, even from his own point of view, and I would say he had negligible success um, after 17 years. And, and you know, while he was doing that, a number of us kind of thought he was a little nuts or on the road to nowhere, but I think far more of us kind of saw a glimmer of hope in what he was doing. Like, yeah, Chris Crawford's a pretty smart guy, a real smart guy. You know, 
maybe he'll actually be able to do it. Like, you know, at least someone smart is working on a really important game design problem like that. I'm not going to work on it because it's kind of, you know, uh, very unlikely to produce fruit or whatever, but at least someone's doing it. And it's great that he's putting that much time and effort into it. It wouldn't be awesome if he did it. I mean, who wouldn't want to delve into one of these clockwork story worlds? And let's not forget about, you know, the facade guys who uh, themselves sunk five years of time into hammering away at the HAL approach, totally different from what Chris Crawford was trying to do. And, you know, at least they, they released, unlike Chris Crawford, who sort of finally released something after 17 years that didn't really work that well, I'd say, at least these guys released something, and it was a finished product, um, and a, you know, a finished drama kind of piece. And, uh, yeah, it was loads of hilarious fun to play. I mean, anybody who's played Facade enjoyed it and laughed and smiled and had a, had a great time. But I, I think it really failed at its primary goal of, and everybody should, I, I talked to a lot of people at the conference who haven't played this or haven't heard of this. I mean, uh, okay, go download it, it's free, play it, please. Uh, uh, but it sort of failed at its primary goal of making characters that really respond in believable ways. You might say, well, that's because players try to break the story, they, they type in things, they can type anything. And they type in things that are goofy or challenge the characters in weird ways that obviously the story wasn't meant to handle. But even if you play it straight, right? Even if you go along with the story and play a character and, and ask realistic questions of the characters, very often they can't really respond to you. And I, this is an example question you might ask Grace. You type in Grace, are you angry at Trip? And you know she might give you a quizzical look like, and start talking about something else to kind of change the subject because she can't understand your question. Um, and that, you gotta keep in mind, that was 2005. That was nearly five years ago. But five years ago, that was enough to pack more opium into our collective green pipes and, um, and <laughs> and sort of shine light on this incredible mountain that must be up there before us, out there in the mist, and so this little faint path through the foothills, like that's where we're gonna get someday, and facade is like this baby step along the way. But given that so much time has passed since it, and nothing else has come out like it, and it's sort of the one thing we can point to that was sort of a mini, tiny little success in that area, sort of gotten us to talk a lot about the reasons for our failures so far in this, in this quest for interactive storytelling. Now David Jaffe is a pretty famous uh, game designer, uh, maybe more famous for his persona online than for his games, but he designed God of War, which is a really famous Greek uh, mythology hack and slash game, and Twisted Metal and some other uh, sort of, I don't know, uh, just, just games. Uh, I, I, they're not necessarily noteworthy for one reason or another. I guess they're successful, they're fun, and they're interesting. Um, but after God of War, he wanted to do something that needs to be a little higher. He started a had decided to invade the United States. As an allegory for us, kind of unilaterally, without provocation, invading a Iraq, China decides to invade the United States and set up an imperialist state here and sort of take over our government. And you play in Heartland a member of a resistance movement that's kind of taking OPEC back over part of the country and, and trying to push the Chinese out um, through, you know, sort of guerrilla warfare, I guess. And as part of this, you know, he, he talks about this dramatic scene that's gonna happen interactively in the game where you're with your commander of, uh, from the resistance movement and you're going into Chinese Americans' homes, you know, because they're the enemy and they may be collaborating with the, with the Chinese that have invaded, and you're, you're rounding them up and questioning them, making them kneel down on the floor in the living room, holding guns to their heads. The son from the family, the teenage son, bolts out of the room, runs up the stairs. Your commander says, go up and get him and bring him back down. And from the first person perspective, you have to march up the stairs, break down his door, he's cowering on the floor, grab him by the collar, drag him down the steps, throw him on the ground next to his mother and, and brother and sister. And, uh, and then eventually the commander will tell you, let's go out of the house, and you go out of the house and lock the doors. He hands you a can of gasoline and says, burn the house with them all alive, and they're the enemy, right? And so that's one of these you know, dramatic, mo emotionally evocative situations that gets you to reflect on you know, the nature of human evil and all these kinds of things, right? And it makes you have, you know, have to answer this difficult question, am I gonna burn this house down or not? My commander told me to, what are gonna be the consequences if I don't? Now, Heartland Project failed for a lot of different reasons. It, it never got to the point where they were even grappling with it. They had those ideas in their head, but they never got to the point where they were grappling with the implementation of that. But even this, despite the failure, David Jaffe still talks about what might have happened if they'd gotten to that point. And he says in an interview, now, this is David Jaffe, so, you know, guess what word's gonna occur in the, oh, am I, am I not, oh, sorry. This is David Jaffe, so, you know, guess what word's gonna occur in the, uh, in the quote here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he says, the minute I give you a gasoline can, or the minute I say, go up after the teenage son who's running to his room, you think, oh, maybe I'll go up here. Oh, what's in this room over here? Oh, hey, look at the mother down there on her knees. What if I shoot her? Oh, well, I can't shoot her. That will fuck up the story. And then he goes on to say, so many things come into play with that whole playground mentality that all that carefully plotted, carefully intended thematic and storytelling, it just crumbles. 
And then he goes on to sort of make a comment about the whole uh, enterprise. He says, unless that AI is capable of recognizing what I'm doing as I'm trying to break the simulation, and it can fold around me and continue to craft the intended story of the artist, while still taking care of the fact that I'm fucking around because I know there's no real danger. You're always going to have a problem creating motion, emotion literally by creating what you see in a film and then trying to make it interactive. And then he goes on to say, I think that really is barking up the wrong tree until the AI gets sophisticated enough uh, that it literally becomes like the holodeck, to reference the work of a Georgia Tech professor. Um, so uh, so that's, that's, that's essentially what he was, he's basically saying, look, you know, David Jaffe sort of challenges the game industry a lot because he says everyone wants to do these kinds of things in these interactive, emotionally evocative situations with characters or whatever. Like, show me, right? Where's the game that does it? Uh, where's the game that does it successfully? And he was sort of trying to do it and realized as he got through the, got into the implementation process, there were a lot of really hard problems that he didn't know how to solve. Now, Chris Hecker is a guy, another relatively famous game designer. He worked on Spore. Um, he's described what he calls the grain of the medium. And the grain of the medium is like, imagine cutting a piece of wood, right? Um, which direction is easiest to cut with the grain? Going against the grain is much harder to cut, harder on your arm, harder on your saw blade. Um, so which works are easiest to make in a medium? What does a medium afford easily? Um, and here's a little quote that he, he, uh, he put on his uh, website about this. He says, unfortunately, for those of us who want games to earn a place in the pantheon of important and emotionally compelling art and entertainment forms, alongside film, literature, music, and visual art, you know, like up there above that red line I put up on that slide, he says, uh, I think the grain of games and interactivity is in some sense running the wrong way. It leads us away from this goal. Um, so, you know, talking about the easiest work to make in a medium and the hardest, take film as an example, which we're always drawing hearts toward, right? Um, so what's the easiest film to make? You take some people, some friends maybe, not even actors, you stick them in your living room, sitting on the couch or standing around the room, you point a camera at them and let them have a conversation. And you do that enough times and you're probably gonna capture a pretty interesting conversation that makes a pretty interesting little so film about um, you know, uh, social tendencies and so on. Uh, without very much effort, without any talent as a director or anything like that. What's the hardest film to make on the other hand? Probably something that involves spaceships uh, flying around outer space and around planets, shooting lasers at each other with big explosions and lots of models and physics and computer graphics and stuff to make all the special effects. You gotta hire industrial light magic that costs uh, millions and millions of dollars and it's really hard to sort of direct that kind of film. Um, so you're not just gonna fall off a log and make Star Wars, right? But you can pretty much fall off a log and, and make a pretty interesting film about characters talking to each other. Um, so what's the easiest game to make? Well, it turns out it's this game where you're flying a little spaceship around with stars in the background shooting things with lasers. Um, that's really easy to simulate on a computer. It's got physics calculate, very simple physics models and physics calculations, inertia of the ship, laser trajectories, little explosions and stuff. What's the hardest game to make? It's you know, a game where characters are talking to each other and having a conversation and somehow you get to interact with that conversation. Um, so um, what are we facing, according to Chris, um, you know, given the situation and the grain of the medium and everything else? He says, I think that it's possible in the very long run, but for the next 10 to 20 years, we need to be discovering the building blocks of interactivity that will let us communicate with players on an emotional level. Um, so essentially he's saying, we don't know how to do this yet. We're kind of stuck for the time being. And he doesn't talk about Chris Crawford uh, for a lot of reasons that I won't go into. But uh, uh, you know, essentially, I will observe that Chris Crawford's been working on this for 17 years. Chris Hecker adds another 20 to that. So it's like 20 more years before we can start making emotionally compelling art that deals with you know, uh, human and social issues with our games. Um, really well, and I'm saying like, yikes, what, right? You know, I'm going to wait until I'm 52 to do this. Um, you know, but on the other hand, this quote isn't so bad because he's talking about building blocks, and so then I would say, well, let's let's talk about baby steps, right? Let's kind of roll back a little bit. I mean, we're not going to take a nap and let our our beards and uh, our beards grow and our hair grow until uh, you know Ray Kurzweil's uh, AI singularity happens, right? So we're going to start doing something. We got to keep you know keep making games, keep chugging ahead. Um, so first, let's scale back, right? Let's drop dialogue, because for the time being, making the slide sort of proves that making dialogue work really well interactively, interactively is really hard, if not impossible for the, for the time being. Let's design these simple little systems and let, let's tell simple little stories with them somehow um, that don't have a lot of complexity. You know, why am I here, you know, guy Jason Rohr, why is Jason Rohr here? Because like two years ago, I made this little dialogue-free, totally interactive game that many people found emotionally compelling, it was Passage, right? Um, and this is a game that you know didn't have any dialogue, it didn't have any characters to talk to you, didn't have any sort of like narrative that kind of got in the way of the gameplay. And, and people kind of emailed me and said, you know, like stuff like, "Wow, um, you know, I love the story that was told through the game mechanics of Passage. I love the fact that there wasn't a story in it, but I could sort of tell this little interactive story. And it was simple, 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 right? There's some, there's like a maze, and there's another character you can run into, and there's some treasure chests, and that's it, right?" <laughs> 
but through those little tiny like little bits of mechanics you can piece together something that actually means something about someone's life, right? Um, so another example of this can be found in Far Cry 2, which was brought up, I think, by Jesper and maybe a couple of other people earlier uh, in the conference. Um, so this, this is a game that is you know, 3D first-person shooter type game, but it contains a lot of emotionally evocative situations, similar to what you might see in a game like Half-Life 2, where it's all from your point of view and all very interactive. They never take the camera away from you do, and do any cutscenes, but without any of the on-rail scripted stuff that Half-Life 2 had. Um, so it, it's not like you're going down a narrow canyon like in Half-Life 2 where you don't really have any choice about where you go and what you do next. In this, I show the map because, um, not because it's immersive, uh, but because it, it sort of demonstrates you know, how complex this world is and you might, have some, you might have several different goals in this world and you need to decide which one you're gonna pick first of all, then how you're gonna get there because this, this is a terrain fraught with uh, adversity and difficulty and a lot of things that are waiting out there to kill you. You take the rivers to avoid the, the road checkpoints when you're gonna go come to this point where you need to like invade some area or something, are you gonna sneak up over the mountainside? Are you gonna come through the valley? Are you gonna go at night? Are you going to try and use an element of surprise? There's all these kind of uh, kind of meaningful choices that you need to make within this system of you know war and depravity, right? I mean, so so even though it's it's you know not really about characters and those types of things, even within the setting of war, you get to make a lot more meaningful choices than you would in you know uh, well, let's say uh, Medal of Honor or something like that, where you're on rails the whole time. Okay, and then Game of the Year 2009, that's another example. You guys are all going to nod in agreement with this, right? Um, Derek is Spelunky, right? Um, you know, and, and as you play this game, it's very simple mechanics, but your choices that you make get meshed with these emergent properties of the mechanics and lead to this kind of gripping, interesting, little tiny, um, always different story about this guy exploring a dangerous cave. Um, which, you know, okay, it's about a guy exploring a dangerous cave. But the interesting thing is that sometimes the situations you encounter and the kind of things you get yourself into and the, there's all these follies that you end up committing that lead to your death in very kind of dramatic ways because of, of stupid mistakes you make or you're being greedy or you're not being careful enough or whatever. Um, they speak directly to the human condition a lot of the times. And Spelunky is this hilarious game and makes us laugh, right? Uh, really loud and really hard a lot of the times at the things that happen to us and the things we get ourselves into. But it's one of these things where it's sort of like, it's funny because it's true, right? Because it kind of relates back to, um, you know, things that we have seen happen in our own lives, not that we were exploring caves and falling spikes, but you know, like we, we didn't look before we leaped or we were greedy and went after too much instead of taking the safe path. Um, so, so these three games, yeah, sure, there aren't really interactive characters in these games. You know, they're mostly about physical objects, you know, navigating spaces, maybe a mechanical metaphor or two, or very simple interactions with characters. Like this is a character, he's a shopkeeper here, and you can go in and pick up something and, and, uh, and press a button to buy it, but you can also run out with it, right? And the shopkeeper then will get angry at you, pull out a shotgun and start chasing you through the level. Um, you know, this is very simple binary, almost binary interaction that you have with them, where you're gonna like play the good, good customer, or you're gonna play like this, this uh, shoplifter, right? And in Passage, you have this very binary relationship with the wife character, the spouse. Do you run into her and join lives with her, or do you not? Do you wait until later in the game and come back and get her? Uh, and in Far Cry 2, there's these buddies, but your interactions with them are very simple. You can never talk to them, really. You can just sort of, like, one will be dying, and you decide whether to save his life or not, or, you know, or they're about to betray you, decide whether to shoot them or not. Um, sort of very binary character relationship. But you know, hey, at least games like these are totally interactive, right? And they're consistent and cohesive, like little interactive worlds. And at least they, um, you know, they touch on the human condition somehow, a little tiny bit, maybe in a very sort of indirect way like Spelunky, or maybe it's about death like Passage, and at least it's about something like that. And I guess they're sort of the best we got if we're trying to do this kind of interactive storytelling thing, this little, these little mini systems that really work well and, and don't sort of, as Chris Hecker would also say, don't write checks they can't cash. Um, the baby steps on the stairway to Chris Hecker's Pantheon, right? Um, I neglected to mention one more interactive storytelling effort. Um, Mask, uh, which actually came out in 2002, but people didn't find out about it until 2007. But it was in development for five years before that. So this is another five-year project um, uh, where, you know, we didn't find out about it until after Facade, even though it came out before Facade. But this is a totally different approach. It's not clockwork, and it's not like an AI HAL kind of approach. It's just a simple branching story web. Um, like a really, really fine-grained choose-your-own-adventure novel. Like, take a choose-your-own-adventure novel from the 80s where you make a decision at the end of each page or the end of each paragraph. This is a choose-your-own-adventure novel, essentially, where you're making a decision at the end of each sentence or the end of each two sentences. Um, and the, and, and it's, it's odd because, you know, you'd say, well, what's that gonna, and it had 3,500 nodes in it, something like that. But it actually worked, right? And, and, and that was really weird. It's like, you'd think that that doesn't work, right? Choose-your-own-adventure sucked, right, in a lot of ways. And, and, and this, a lot of people thought this was really great and it made it onto top 100 games of all time from PC Gamer and 
you know, a lot of people said, wow, this is, I didn't expect this to work, but it did. And in the process of actually working, along with exciting some people, it also pissed a lot of people off. Uh, a lot of people really hate this game um, because it, it worked without making any progress on these technical holy grail problems that I've been talking about, right? Um, these sort of pipe dreams. We all have these pipe dreams in the back of our head of how we're going to be game designers and make these really complex systems that are going to do this. And this isn't a complex system. It's just a giant web of 3,500 nodes. Um, and why is this successful? Why do I say that? Why do I say that it worked? Because, you know, what's the goal here, right? Yes, mask characters respond to you in realistic ways to your every action. Um, yes, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted most of the time. You know, here's an example where you're in this very tense situation. This is not characteristic of, of the whole game. There's a lot of just talking to people and other stuff. But if you go down the wrong path, you'll end up in a place like this. And, uh, or it might be the right path, depending on how you think about it. But uh, there's five choices here. And there's, they're pretty disparate choices, right? Do you want to uh, bargain with the police, threaten the police, surrender to them, and end up going to jail, or do nothing and see what they do? You know, and it's like, well, I, could, I can't throw the knife at the police. I can't spit in their face. You know, there's a couple of things you can't do. But, but most of the big picture kinds of things that you might want to do in that situation are covered. Um, but the problem is, the reason this pisses people off is because there's no illusion here, right? These are just, these guys here who are talking to you, they're just, they're just pre-baked characters, uh, you know, existing in this, in this pre-authored story web. They're not, you know, artificial people. They're not clockwork people. And I think that's kind of what we want when it boils down to it. That's what we're, we're dreaming about. That's the pipe dream, really, if you kind of pick away at all this other stuff that's been accumulating over 30 years. What are we really after? It, it's, like we're, it's like we're after clockwork people. And, and, we, and we look at other areas of science that are sort of working toward clockwork. People like AI, the AI world, right? They've been on this windmill quest of their own since Turing proposed his little t test and talked about being excited to break in like a schoolmaster and see how the AI is doing, right? And, um, you know, the AI world's really failed at this, failed at making clockwork people for us. I mean, we were dreaming about HAL back in the 70s, right? And what was that, 60s? When was 2001? 60s? Late 60s, 70s. Uh, 69, in the, in the late 60s. We've been dreaming about that kind of stuff for a long time. We've been dreaming about HAL, right? Not a computer that you can just play chess against, like Deep Blue, but it, you can do that, but you can also talk to it um, and ask it how it's feeling, and it can feel scared, and all these kinds of things that, you know, that uh, Kubrick and, uh, and Arthur C. Clarke were dreaming about. Um, and it's been 50 years, and wow, we really haven't made any progress in the direction of like these AIs that we can actually have conversations with. And the robotics world, too. I mean, God, they've been working that even longer, like hundreds of years, right? Um, trying to kind of make these clockwork people, and it's really kind of failed. I mean, yeah, every once in a while you see a cool, like, Japanese robot demonstration, like, dancing or something like that, and these kind of cute Japanese women robots, um, you know, but I don't know, they're kind of creepy, and, and they, they, uh, you can't really interact with them the way you might want to. Um, so we sort of see this glimmer of hope in our own medium to help make these clockwork people. Um, you know, like, maybe we can get away from having to worry about physical implementation. We've got these virtual spaces. And we already have all of the computer kind of guts, uh, computer algorithm guts working right in there. So maybe we're going to make progress where they couldn't. And then you say, but why? You know, why would anybody want a mechanical Turk, right? And and it's kind of strange because when you think about the mechanical Turk and you look at this picture, this picture highlights something very strange. It's like one 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 person sitting there playing chess, right, um, and waiting for you to walk up. And throughout this entire talk, throughout all the games that I've discussed, they're sort of making baby steps and often put up on pedestals and all these things. Um, and actually, through most of the games that have been talked about um, at this com entire conference, with the exception of like one or two, um, uh, and some of the sports and things, uh, and all the quotes that I've covered in this talk, and we're talking about interactive storytelling, uh, in the, I'm talking about that in this talk, never mentioned something. It's a strange admission given that we're talking about games, right? We've never talked really very much about the other player, right? You know, so, so if you start thinking about games that way, you know, what, is the, what is the grain of our media? Instead of doing Chris Hacker's experiment where you sit down with the computer and figure out what games he's to make, you know, sit down around a kitchen table with some friends. What's the easiest game to make, right? It's, it's, it's a game where you talk to each other a lot and you have negotiation and promises and you befriend each other and you betray each other uh, and you backstab and so on and engage in a lot of these really complex, nuanced social things. Um, you know, like the kinds of interactions that were happening around 16 tons um, beyond just the game mechanics, right? Um, you know, maybe a game like a social game like Werewolf is really easy to make, you know, around the kitchen table with your friend. On the other hand, in that situation, what's the hardest game to make? What's the grain of the medium running against in that situation? It's one where, you know, spaceships fly around and shoot each other, uh, and you're calculating laser trajectories and spaceship velocities and trying to make things explode and, and whatever. This is like, I don't know, what, this is like a Star Wars hex grid war game or something. Um, so I think part of our problem, oh man, I left one of my props down there. Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop down. I'm going to break the fourth wall here and grab uh, 
get back on stage. The fourth wall is broken, yes. I destroyed the illusion. Um, you know, part of the problem is connected to how we think about movies and how we connect games to movies. Because, um, you know, a movie is like this little self-contained box, right? Uh, that we can sort of bring home, with our, with, bring home on our own and sort of operate in isolation. We can sort of like you know, pop this thing open. We can take the disc out, pop it into our DVD player, and sit down by ourselves in front of the screen and consume it. Um, and it's all there, right? When you go to get a movie from Netflix or from the store or whatever, it's like you buy this little box and everything's in it, right? The characters are in here, the dialogue is in here, the plot is in here, and the author put it all in there for us waiting to be discovered, right? And I think we neglect thinking about, talking about other players when we talk about the artistic future of games in particular. Um, in part because we want like, our artistic games especially to be like these little boxes, right? These little boxes that are self-contained and you can kind of bring home and unpack. And when we talk about characters in games especially, we're almost always talking about somehow having this little box that you can buy and open up and there's going to be all these little interactive characters waiting inside to interact with, right? They're going to spring forth and the author kind of put them all in there somehow with some sort of, some sort of, some sort of magic computer algorithms and, and they're all kind of in here waiting for you, waiting to be unlocked, right? Um, so I think, you know, when we, when we think about like the affinity of our medium to another one, and this is just the common one, not necessarily one that you know, sort of the avant-garde game designers believe in, right? But, we have this affinity to movies, and we're always talking about generally about movie, our games becoming more cinematic. I think those hearts are really kind of flowing toward the wrong target. Because, you know, if we want to make games that deal with the human condition and these social issues and emotional relevant, emotionally relevant things, culturally relevant things, and we want to do it like now, like today, or we actually wanted to do it 30 years ago when we first started talking about this stuff. Um, uh, you know, we don't want to sit around and wait 20 more years for this hypothetical AI singularity that you know, Kurzweil or whoever else is predicting. Um, that's in the distant future, and we don't want to be taking just little baby steps and, and things like that. We want to have these interactive characters now that you can actually talk to and you can actually ask questions of and get realistic answers from and, you know, um, maybe lie to or, or uh, maybe have them, you know, an interactive character that can even fall in love with you or laugh at your jokes or get angry at you, right? Those things that we really don't have and we're just dreaming of. Then I think that we should be looking in a different, um, different direction entirely. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions. You can start a short question. Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh thanks. Um, I was just, I wanted to ask, uh, how come you think it is we don't worry about uh, how games uh, that are mostly physical representations um, allow the player to do things that we don't want them to do, right? This isn't a problem in Halo 3, or it is. It, it's precisely a problem, right? It's a problem that we set about solving. So um, we don't want a player, for example, to be able to kill uh, you know, a hunter really easily with a, with a single headshot or something like that, right? So we impose constraints on that. Is, isn't the real problem that social rules and emotional rules precisely aren't interesting to most game designers and so they haven't actually elaborated uh, complicated regimes to manage them? I, I, uh, they're not interesting? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, some people, I mean, obviously Chris Crawford has tried, you know, obviously the facade people have tried, the mask people have tried, and I guess I, out of all those people have succeeded more than the others potentially. But are, are those the people that we trust to be experts on what social and emotional rules in our culture are? I mean, are they authorities or have they done any research or have <laughs> any under special understanding Right, they're just engineers, right? right? They're just like, you know, they got the nose of the computer screen, they don't like, they're, they're autistic, you know, they've got Asperger's syndrome. In fact, don't they play video games because they're trying to escape those rules? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, I don't, yeah, so, so I guess that's one answer is that, right, we're just not trying hard enough. We don't have the right people working on it. I don't know about trying harder, or, or maybe we don't trying have the right people, smarter. You're basically yeah. saying we don't have the right people working on it. And you sort of sound like you, you got an opium pipe in your backpack, that you sort of had this back burner dream too, just like the rest of them. Like, you know, and, and, and some of the people who were doing this stuff early on, like, you know, com coming up with ideas like Hamlet on the Holodeck and some of these pipe dreams that have been, like, burning in our pipes collectively for 30 years or whatever, um, they... You know, they weren't engineers. They were sort of these people outside. These, these were media scientists, people who were sort of social scientists, people who were studying culture, studying the trajectory of culture. And, and so they weren't really 
And that's part of the reason why, well, they would say, well, I'm not going to implement this thing. I'm not an engineer. I, I put this idea out there for someone else to implement, hopefully, and no one ever did, or they tried and they failed. I mean, I think the problem's a lot harder than you think it is. I don't think you do. I think it's, I think it's very hard. But I, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if I think, I think the hardest thing about it is that there is no the problem. Um, the, the idea that we conceive of it as the problem with one solution is the first problem. Right, right, right. right. Okay, uh, well, so in a, um, first of all, overall, thank you. Uh, great speech. Um, it, it was to, to try to connect this to the game that you had on show last night. Um, so is it, you, I feel like you kind of led to it and then didn't finish it. Is it to say a person on the other side is kind of maybe the correct solution to, to like the how problem is, is a guy named Hal sitting there on the other side, like <laughs> replying. Right, right. Um, so to that end. Like uh, just throwing the Turing test out the window. I mean, yeah. actually, ironically, Chris Hacker's working on a game that does this too. Where uh, you are, you know, a spy party game is a game where you're trying to, there's two players playing. One is the spy sneaking around inside this party trying to look like one of the guests. And the other person is the sniper looking through the window trying to shoot the spy and figure out which of these characters, all of them are computer controlled except for one, yeah. which is the human. Well, so it's a reverse Turing test. So he's kind of doing this stuff interestingly in, in a similar direction too, right? But, but, so, I mean, so the, but meanwhile, so, the, the, so of course the challenge with that is like part of why people will sit around and watch Seinfeld instead of sit around and talk to their own friends is that uh, professionals who are masters in their field devoted their energy to contriving a situation that would have things more interesting that would happen in a real 30-minute segment right. any given 30 minutes. Like compressed and, and filtered. It'd and skip a day of time and, yeah. Right, right. Um, and planned I, out and the perfect little nugget of entertainment. And right. then to the extent that we can do this with the person on their side, how is what's being done in the series artistically different than what we're already doing with MUDs or MMOs? Or right, I guess I'm, I'm basically like saying that those kinds of things, like. Look, I mean, basically, I, I don't necessarily think that the only way forward for games is to even deal with characters, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting things to hap that can happen just in terms of abstract mechanics, and I've explored some of that stuff myself. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, there's this sort of pipe dream that's still lingering. People still talk about it all the time, and, like, you know, the idea that there's somehow we should be doing that. And, like, we can't. And this is <laughs> a hard unsolved problem, and, oh, my God, you know, think of these AI things we're going to come up with and all this complicated stuff. And we've been talking about it for 30 years, and some, some of our brightest minds have been sort of swallowed by it, right? Yes. I mean, call Chris Crawford one of our greatest minds. Um, if we call him swallowed so, by. He certainly <laughs> has the greatest fashion sense of any of us in the industry. Uh, but uh, so I guess this problem isn't that hard if you flip it upside down and like look at something like a mud. I mean, uh, and, I, and I guess, you know, uh, John, uh, John Romero was talking to me at lunch the other day about this role, this elaborate role playing game he used to play inside the walls of, of uh, or with his friends from, from id and how it went on for years, and it was so elaborate and so nuanced, and it was all in the head of one of the people who had sort of crafted the story world. And, and hearing that, you know, it sounded really like a, an interesting cultural, artistic kind of experience that I've, I've never really had that kind yeah, of experience. Yeah, we, we, we want a way to put him in a box, because otherwise we don't all know that guy. Is the Right, oh, we don't know the guy who's good at it. Yeah. That's oh, the, anyway. I see. But I don't know, I guess 16 tons, we were playing with strangers. And there were really interesting social conversations that were happening. I was interacting with characters, Yeah. Okay. you know? Thank you. Um, uh, gosh, I'm, I'll try and put this into the form of a question. Although I think my question will be to lead up to asking you, Jason, to tell the audience a little bit more about the game um, that the conference commissioned uh, that I played last night. And if anyone hasn't played it, I definitely encourage you to ride the shuttle bus over to the gallery this lunchtime and have a go with it. Um, I was really impressed in my play experience of it by the way that you had neatly sidestepped either of these difficult problems, either to create like a clockwork deterministic person that can participate in a drama or like solving the hard AI solution of creating a, a perhaps a real person who could participate in a drama simply by plonking uh, another human being in that role. And in actual fact, I was even more interested by the way that that human being kind of became the primary player. I've only played it from the point of view of the author rather than the the the, like the player participant. The participant. Right. Right. Um, but I did get the sense that my experience was even kind of richer. It was certainly more edgy because I was like the responsibility was kind of on me to keep things moving along, where he could just kind of play in a bit more in a, in a freer way. So. I guess my, my question would be, what's the thing that you want this audience to know so that they'll go and play it at lunchtime? <laughs> okay, well, when I, when I came up with the idea for this game, or I was working through, I was basically sort of, I had been following this argument and this discussion for a number of years, right? And it sort of came to a head, I think, when David Jaffe had that interview where he was talking about the failed Heartland project. 
and, um, and just talking about, you know, basically show me the money. Everyone's claiming games should do this and have more characters and so on, but show me a game that actually does it. It's a really hard problem and so on. And then Chris Hecker talking about, you know, how far away we were all the time from actually doing this and how, and there were games that came out that had characters in them and so on, like Terry Cavanaugh's game Judith, but, you know, Chris Hecker would say, well, this basically failed because we don't have enough sim yet. He would use those words. We don't have enough sim yet. Um, in other words, we haven't figured out how to simulate these characters and these situations to the point where you can actually interact with them fully, so we have these stunted interactions. And so I was just sort of thinking about that, like, what's the response to that? You know, how can we sort of sidestep this? How can we turn this problem upside down and see it from a new angle? And, and then I started thinking about, well, why is it that we want to sit alone with our computers anyway and, and have these little, these little art experiences by ourselves? Um, or maybe it's friends sitting behind us watching us have an art experience by ourselves and kind of talking over our shoulder. And I guess part of it is because we think it's going to be sort of burdensome to have a human, like, if you're learning how to play chess, it's really burdensome for a chess master to sit there and play a bunch of beginner games with you. So you create something chess master, called Chess Master 2000, sit the beginner down with it, takes away the burden from someone teaching how to play chess. I can sit down with Chess Master, hone my chess skills, and eventually go and play with my friend you know, who's much better at it than me. Um, but in this case, I realized that I, the hypothesis beforehand when I started the development was like, actually, it might be more interesting to be the person in control than the person just playing and seeing the illusion, right? It's certainly going to be more tense because you've got 30 seconds or a very short amount of time to sort of instantly respond to, in some believable way with all these characters that are around to the one action that this one player character has made. So maybe it won't be such a burden. Maybe it'll actually be cool and the more interesting side and you'll be pestering each other to play as controller. And I think that really panned out. You know, I'm really happy with that because you know, in, in playing the game myself, you know, I found that I mean, playing the controller is a great, I mean, for me personally, is a great experience. Um, and you know, yeah, and, and actually playing the player in a way is, is kind of boring just controlling one character, right? Um, right, yeah, how good the controller was and how fast they could respond. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily have to be boring, but I'm just saying it's not as exciting. It's certainly not as tense. You're sort of sitting around waiting for how the world's going to change to this response to the one thing that you got to do on your turn. But the controller gets to kind of manipulate all these different things. So I think that was sort of this insight. Like, you flip the problem upside down, and it's, you know, uh, it sort of becomes solvable all of a sudden, and then you question, well, would that even work? And then you say, well, yeah, it'd actually be kind of cool to be the controller. Let's try it, and you know, I, I guess it seems to work well, well enough. You know, where like I feel like I've been able to tell very meaningful stories to some people that I care about a lot through the system. You know, which I could ne never have done with like a single-player game design, at least today, with the things that I know of how to do in terms of making characters and so on. One more. Uh, thanks for the talk, and uh, just I want to say I really like the game. I really appreciate it. And I'm actually kind of surprised that in a, a room full of nerds, we're not talking about Dungeons and Dragons a little bit more in this <laughs> yes. conversation. Because um, I must I, admit that I, I'm, I'm going to get 12-sided dice thrown at me right now, but I've never rolled 12-sided dice. Yeah. Really. Well. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of surprising because uh, I think you know that there can be, uh, you know, the interactive storytelling as the as the Project Xanadu is kind of, you know, that's like the first thing that I think of anyway, and. You know, there's like Neverwinter Nights one. You had a DM tool set where you could right. People have been talking DM. to me about that a lot. Yeah. And uh, you know, and even as recently as like Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2, you can control the zombies. And if you want, you can make that a narrative. You know, if you just go after Lewis the first time, it's like why is the AI? You know, why is this? It's, it's a story. Yeah, I mean, I guess Left 4 Dead is another great example. I mean, yeah. basically, what I'm looking at is like this is sort of like theater. Yeah. It's also sort of like a puppet show. Yeah. And Left 4 Dead is very much when you're playing the full. How many players can you have at once? Or you have eight. You have four zombies and four humans. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Um, so that game is is very much like you know a puppet show. Yeah. And um, I guess. And I think that kind of stuff is really really cool. And yeah, we should be doing that a lot more, especially yeah. if we're trying to tackle this this, this human problem. My question is, um, did you think about doing the game that you? Uh, did you ever think about at any point doing it like a double blind type of thing where that you don't know you're playing with another person and right the Turing test version yeah like it, you know or, or like the the debut of this game at the conference was me behind the curtain yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely and or, people walked or, up or, and said what is this yeah, Jason Roar's new one screen game you know and and then the things actually like have believable responses to them yeah I, I I dreamed about that a little bit but then I was like that's not really the point you know that right. illusion will only be a very, a very ephemeral illusion that will evaporate as soon as like people say yes this is how it really works folks yeah right okay yeah, let's exactly, get on with yeah. learning how to use this thing yeah 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 that's so a one, I didn't really want I didn't really want it to be a man behind the curtain I mean it's basically like saying aha touche you know like I, I got you you AI loving yeah, folk you yeah, know. Right, yeah you thought this was an AI and I was really crafty but no it was just me you know ha 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 I, I didn't want it to be about that right it's sort of about this cool system right that I I, I think you know is 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 you should sort of like 
be watching the player side and then periodically peeking back over as a spectator. How is that person doing that? Oh, look how complicated and interesting this is and this, this elaborate Baroque interface that you have to use to make this world happen, right? Um, thank so, you. thank you.